Greenhouse farming is a new endeavor that only a handful of people are engaged in here in Ghana. One of such facilities is the amazing Grace Greenhouse Farms here in Ketase in the eastern region. On GN Exclusive today, we are exploring how a greenhouse is operated for commercial purposes. A greenhouse is a building in which plants are grown. It could either be made of glass or plastic, and conditions inside the building are strictly controlled. Located at Ebri Ketase, not far from the Piduase Lodge, the amazing Grace Greenhouse Tomato Farm is run by Reverend John Adote and his son Timothy. The farmers began harvesting tomatoes for the first time about three weeks ago after planting early this year. As with greenhouses, conditions inside the facility are strictly controlled to optimize growth. Did we have to step into this um, water before coming into the greenhouse? Well, it's not the ordinary water. We have a disinfectant in it, chlorine. Uh, to ensure that uh, we don't introduce any germs or anything into the environment because the environment is controlled. So when you say controlled environment, what other things are you controlling here? You you realize later on that uh, these things are growing in troughs. Uh, we, we control the water, the volume of water. The way we have put up the structure also controls the sunlight that comes in and the wind, the, the, the air that comes in. Actually, to some extent, the temperature is also uh, involved. Yeah, so everything is controlled. Okay. So You see that uh, once the net is here, uh, we don't have insects coming in, you know, to pollinate. The pollination is done by uh, artificial means. I mean, we, we just assist the plants to pollinate oh, itself. Okay. Some farmers farming outside you know the contents of the soil, you know the uh, uh, the nutrient content and what they should add and what they should subtract. Some of them do. Some don't know anything about it. But here everything is controlled. We know the amount of nitrate that they should have, the amount of calcium that they should have. You know, is well balanced uh, according to the water volume that uh, oh, okay. we, 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 we push into the system. So you don't have problems with weeds, pests and all that? No, 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 no. We don't have problems because we make sure that uh, uh, they are not entertained. They are not okay. entertained at all because the moment they come in, they will destroy the whole uh, farm. Oh, okay. So please, if you can take us back, when did this whole... Um, project start? When did you conceive the idea to start such a project? Well, I come from a family of uh, farmers. Uh, we've been farmers. My father read uh, poultry to pay our school fees and we finished. So when we also, when I also came out of university, started working, uh, I started a poultry project. We did the poultry for some time and then we went into farming. Uh, we had a large uh, acre of uh, land at, uh, around at, in Sawam, mm -hmm. where we went into pineapple production. In fact, there were people who were buying, who were, they were going to export until that MD, MD2, MD2 issue came when the, I think it was a sabotage, you know, against African countries. So uh, it destroyed the pineapple business at that time. So I stopped. And then we did a little bit of uh, pineapple juice production. Uh, that one too. I was then uh, head of work, and then I was thinking of what to do in retirement because I'm a very active person. <laughs> then I went, then I joined the church. I was in the church. I realized that there were quite a lot of young men and women without jobs. So I decided to just set up the pineapple juices to employ them to gain people instead of always giving something to them. If, you know, they get a job, then they'll also be self-sufficient. That's how the whole thing started. But then uh, I had problems with the marketing managers, you know, things didn't go well, so I stopped. 
And then when I came on pension fully now, I decided to go into the farming again. Okay. Yes, and uh, I started, I had discussion with a friend, uh, the so-called uh, uh, da, Danakwe, uh, he's the director of uh, ASNAP. So he started showing me new concepts that have come into the farming industry. We were be discussing this for some time. And then finally I settled on this, uh, on this system. The greenhouse has a minimum capacity of about 550 plants grown in 10 troughs. How many tons do you expect after the cycle? Yes, we are expecting an average of 5 to 8 tons per cycle. Oh, okay. Yes, because looking at um, the calculations we have, a full acre, one acre, will give you a range of 150 tons to 200 tons. So we have one eighth of an acre. So dividing one eighth of an acre is we, it's a range between five to eight tons per what we have here. We normally do pruning too. If there is a side shoot, then we remove it. Okay. Come uh -huh. We remove it. Uh, we remove the side shoots because um, this side shoot too is taking some of the nutrients, and we want only two of the stems. Two yes. So because, so if there is an other side shoot, then we remove it. So when we remove it, we call it pruning. So basically, you, you don't want any other factor to be competing with the plant yes, for exactly. nutrients. Yes. yes. We have to nurse it for 21 days and then after 21 days you look at the size and the thickness of the stalk the stems and all that and removing them from where you've uh, nursed them to this is called transplanting mm -hmm. you need to do the transplanting and even that if you don't handle it well you will cause stress to the plant oh, okay. because you've taken it from one environment to another environment so you have to be very, very, very careful. So do they you nest them nested. here? Yes, we nest them. We have a, a tree where they are nest, and then when it's time for them to be transplanted, you must know how to handle them. If your hand is shaking and you do that, it will cause stress. It can cause something like this, meaning that the plant has been disturbed. You know, So the transplanting is also very important. Okay. The least thing that you do to them that to uh, make them feel uncomfortable, then they become stressed, oh, okay. and it can show in the yield mm -hmm. that uh, the flowers, the flowers the everything, the, the size of the fruits, the quantity. Now, if you look at another fruit over there, this one. you see, you see how different it's, it's breaking. Oh, okay. So, I mean, for my artistic qualities, I, I look out for these things. Apart from running the, the the greenhouse professionally, but it gives me joy just to see how I mean God's handiwork is for each individual fruit. The way it breaks is different from the next one. No, uh, does that mean there are different varieties? No, it's it's one variety. But I'm talking about the way they change color from green, mm -hmm. they ripen. Okay. So you, as I explained earlier, you see how the red is down at two sides. Mm -hmm. But the other fruit which I pointed out to you, you see that that one is more even. Oh, okay. You see, so just for a person who enjoys art, you know, when you see these various colors, then it gives you some joy. 
Now, look, look at look at look at this. This is also breaking. Out. Breaking, but you see the way it is. It's almost even. Okay. But for the one down there, this one is breaking from the top. The top. Mm -hmm. I, I, you understand? Yeah. So that is just by the by, just for the artistic you know, value. Yes. But it's it's a real joy to see the plants doing very well. How long does it take from planting to harvesting? From planting to harvesting, it takes roughly about four months. We are expecting to harvest for four months continuous. Mm -hmm. Then we'll take these ones off and then introduce a new batch into the greenhouse. Oh, okay. We have a harvesting schedule. We normally harvest every three days. And what we do is the plant itself, the plant itself grows according to stages. So from transplant, you have the first flower, which will produce a bunch. Mm -hmm. Second flower, third flower, fourth flower, fifth. And this is what is called the indeterminate type, mm -hmm. which means it will keep growing until the kingdom come. Oh, okay. But definitely after some time, the, uh, the yield would begin to dip. So after some time, what you do is that you just cut off. And we have given ourselves four months okay. so that we plant a new cycle. So for the harvesting schedule, what we have is that we go through the first flower stage where they are fruited. And for the ones which have broken, meaning that they've begun to ripen, mm -hmm. what we do is we have secateurs which we use to cut, cut them. Yeah. So he will just demonstrate. Yeah. Ernest will demonstrate it for you. So that is what okay. we do. But this is not ready to eat, is it? It is not not ready to eat as such. But you see, you also need to take into account the duration within which it will get to the end user. Mm -hmm. And so what the distributors want is a fruit which is broken just like this. Mm -hmm. So that between transporting it to their facility, sorting them out, sending them to the distribution centers, and the consumers themselves going into the shops to buy. And then the consumers placing them in their kitchens for a number of days. They don't want the tomatoes to, to, to go rotten. Oh, okay. So what you do is that you harvest just immediately after they've broken. Oh, okay. So that they can have a long shelf life. Mm -hmm. But the vari variety that we have here, we have tested it. And if in ideal situations, it can last for up to two weeks, 14 days. Oh, okay. yes. Without refrigeration just on the, your kitchen table mm. for 14 days. Oh, yeah. So that is what happens. So you see that the first flower stage, what NS harvested, there are some which have not yet broken. Mm -hmm. So within the next three days, some would break, and then those would be harvested. So you okay. continue harvesting until you get to the time when you say you want to replace this with another batch of uh, seedlings. And okay. then you, you so carry if you on. want to replace it with another batch of seedlings, you pull, all these plants will go away? Yes, we'll have to take them out gently because oh, okay. we need to keep what we have here is what is called soilless medium. It is uh, coconut husks oh, which okay. have been beaten into powder. That's sort of. fine. Yes. Mm, can so, I touch it? Yes, you can. Oh, okay. You can. Oh, okay. You see, it's rough, it's fiber. Oh, okay. And it is nutritionless. So what we do is that we, because all soil contains some amount of nutrition mm -hmm. for the plants, and this is what we call the soilless medium, we need to inject the nutrients which would assist the plants to grow. And that is why we have the dripper lines, oh, okay. which we use to distribute, oh, okay. we use to distribute both the water and the right amount of nutrients for the plants because they need different amounts at different stages in their life. And that is what makes this a bit more scientific. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so if I understand correctly, the plants are not growing out of the soil? No, they are not growing out of soil. Oh, okay. They are growing out of what is called soilless media. Oh, okay. Some use coconut husks, others use rice husks. It depends. I mean, there are various types on the on and the this market. Is coconut this husk. is coconut husk. And you put in the right amount of nutrients and water. Exactly. For your so plant. you see backward integration. Some okay. companies in Ghana here can, if they apply themselves to it, 
become producers of this soilless medium mm -hmm. for greenhouse farmers in Ghana. So you they see will the also say that endless. they will also say that this is a, 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 a new endeavor and it's expensive. So how many people will even go into greenhouse uh, uh, and farming? You understand? Yes, but you see, when you, when you, you, you your, your heart is in something, you work towards it. I mean, the investment which has been sunk into this enterprise, it's, it's no joke. But it's because we see the end in sight. So you make the necessary sacrifice today for a better tomorrow, to use... Uh, uh, a modern, you know, phrase. I don't want to go there, you understand. <laughs> and yes. talking about a better tomorrow, uh, um, where do you see yourself in the next few years? How do you intend to scale up? Yes, uh, what we have here is a test site. We are using two tunnels to learn the appropriate lessons. Which ones are the tunnels? This is one tunnel. Oh, okay. And you are standing in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is another tunnel. Oh, okay. So they are, they are called trellis bays. You can put up as many as the land space would allow you. For this particular site, even though we imported three, we could only fit two in. But as I said, we are learning the lessons here so that we can scale up to 10, uh, ten tunnels at a si or more at a site which we have at Insawam, which is capable of uh, accommodating as many, even 20 or 30 okay. tunnels okay. easily. Okay. easily. Okay. When we were coming in, I, I counted three, um, ten troughs or lines, yes. yeah, which means each tunnel takes five? Yes. Y you know, uh, what we do here in a greenhouse is that you, you do not take into account space too much. What happens in the open field is that they, they, they plant and then the population is much more higher than what the land can take. Mm -hmm. But in a greenhouse, you plant in a soilless medium and you allow for these kinds of walkways. But because it is in troughs, so you can plant a higher number of plants per square meter, if you take just the troughs into account, taking away all these walkways. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is a plant population which would be higher in terms of population than what a normal farmer would do in the open field. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is to have greater yield. So first of all, you start with the medium which you do the planting. The medium is very important. After you have sorted out the medium, the next critical factor is the seed that you would want to plant. You must get the right seed from the right source. Because if you don't get the right seed, you may plant and then you lose everything. So first of all, the planting medium is important. Two, the seed that you use is also important. Yeah. And then three, of course, the controlling conditions. Mm -hmm. Making sure that you don't just water the plants, but you water the plants as and when they need water in the right quantities. And also mixing the right amount of nutrients that the plants need every step of their growth. Oh, okay. So that enables us to get a higher yield in a greenhouse. Then, of course, you, you see that we have twined the plants. Mm -hmm. What happens in the open field is that even though some attempt twining, you see that when you go there, most of the fruits are hanging on the floor. Wait, I mean, when you say twine, what, what do you mean? I'm talking about this rope. Okay, supporting it with Support, the rope. exactly. So the plants just, you, you twirl the rope around the plant mm. so that it gives the plant, it, it's quite heavy. You can, if you hold it, you see how heavy it is. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, so you can imagine having about seven or eight of these on just one vine. So you need to support it, and that is what we do with, with the vine. Oh. We trellis it. And as I was explaining, in the open field, what they do is that even though they provide some sort of support, the support is not adequate. So you see the fruits hanging on the floor, and as they move about doing their daily husbandry, you see they bruise them.
that is how we harvest it. We use the shears mm -hmm. to cut the stock. Oh, okay. We don't just pull it out, we just cut it to the shears. One after the other. Oh, okay. Wow, that's a, that, that, those has really yes. yeah. then it, you see that it is firm yeah so yeah. that gives you an indication of the shelf life mm -hmm. and it is fleshy oh okay they're not watching like the mm -hmm. local variety okay okay so okay so we'll put, mm -hmm. so i hold it yeah, this hold way it. and if oh, oh don't pull it you don't okay. don't pull it just Hold it here mm -hmm. and cut the stock. Okay. It's too. It's close to each other. Yes. Try. Can you pass it? No. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So then. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Also. Yes. Very well. Okay. And then they, they'll try this one too. You can give me. Okay. okay. So if I don't cut it from here, from the stock, and I pull it, what happens? It, it, it goes back quickly? It stresses the, it stresses the, the others. And it, it will affect their, their, their shelf, shelf like for the ripening. Oh, okay. They are okay. very delicate. Yeah. They are like babies. So, <laughs> so you have to take very good care of them. And for instance, like this one, mm -hmm. if you don't take it, don't hold it and cut the stalk, mm -hmm. and you pull it, some of the unripe ones can fall. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And the tomatoes are higher than your height. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, so I have one here. Hey, I have we, to come and work here. We are farming every part of the farm. <laughs> 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 Reverend Adote tells me he draws knowledge from a local farmer to support his project. Some of the things are not workable here. They have done it in the field. So we are picking that knowledge and it's yielding results. For instance, when we go to the fourth and the fifth flower, you know, we're told that when it is fruiting, they need more water mm -hmm. to bear fruits and grow. So when we got there, because I want good fruits, I was just increasing from mm -hmm. eight to 12. Mm -hmm. Eight minutes to 12 minutes, every watering this day. And that time he had traveled. He went uh, he went on the Easter break and left me alone <laughs> without the local knowledge. So I was just pumping the water into it. Then when he came and he saw this, he said, no, 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 no. where we have reached now, there's enough water. We have to reduce the water yeah. because these are the signs. Mm -hmm. These are the signs. When he showed us the signs, we saw it. And uh, we say that it's working. The business looks promising. However, putting up a greenhouse came with its own challenges. They say it's a new one, and we ordered all the things, the, the infrastructure from South Africa. So it must that, have been very expensive, putting this together, the greenhouse. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I should say it's expensive. I should say it's expensive. Um, the initial cost that the infrastructure itself, I think I spent almost about $25,000. Mm -hmm. $25,000 to import uh, the equipment in. Remember when it came, we had a problem of clearing it. So I was to pay tax over a hundred uh, million. Wow. Uh, for, yes, four hundred something dollars. But uh, that one was sweet because it's purely agricultural, okay. this thing. It has been expensive, but uh, uh, I enjoy farming. I enjoy to see this. You see, my house is just there and I have a lot of energy and strength <laughs> so when i wake up i want to walk somewhere mm -hmm. that's why i just uh, yeah. yeah just just to exercise mm -hmm. the, the the body but now the running and everything my son my son is yes is fully is fully in control first of all uh, we needed to prepare the land as you can see this land naturally slopes so the first thing that we needed to do was to reduce the gradient so we had to call in earth-moving equipment to dig up the earth 
and level the land just a little bit so that you have a slight gradient because the water that you, you feed the plants, they will not take all. Some would have to drain and, and go out so that the medium is not waterlogged. So the greenhouse needs just a slight gradient. So that is what we did with the earth moving equipment. Now, after that, you can see that there are several steel tubes, both at the ends and in the middle mm -hmm. of the tunnels. What we had to do was to dig about a half a meter into the soil okay. and then put in some metal struts. You mean the poles? No, not the poles. We haven't even come to the poles. Oh, okay. They are short met metals about this high. Oh, okay. And they are supposed to secure the, the structure. Mm -hmm. So you put them in half a meter with concrete. concrete. And then the concrete sets with that metal. Before you bring the tubes, the tubes are hollow. So you put the tubes on those uh, metals and then you, you screw them with bolts and nut. So that makes them upright. And you can see, just by counting, one, two, three, four, five, I mean, there are over 150 of those tubes, mm -hmm. and we had to do each of them individually. Now, after putting up the tubes, what we needed to do also was to secure them. So over here, you can see that there are some metal bars which cross mm -hmm. in between. They are also feather supports oh, okay. to make sure because you, when you are putting up a greenhouse, mm -hmm. you must take into account the direction of the wind, mm -hmm. the velocity of the wind, so that you, whilst you are asleep in the night, you don't wake up in the morning <laughs> to come and see that the whole greenhouse is what yes. is on the ground. Mm -hmm. So these are additional supports. The, the metals which we've crossed them, they're cross beams. The additional supports. After that, then we had to put up the arches. Okay. Now, the arches needed to be secured. Yes, the arches. Yeah. Now, the arches needed to be secured with what we call a U-bolt. And you can see one of them just underneath the gutter, mm -hmm. where the blue uh, rope is. Okay. It's a U-shape with another extension at the bottom. Uh -huh. So the bottom one goes into one of the, of the metal tubes. And then the arches are placed gently and delicately to fit into those U-tubes. Okay. Now, when you do that, then you put up what is called the gantry, which is that central beam yeah. in the middle. Okay. It's quite heavy, I have mm -hmm. to tell you. Mm -hmm. Very heavy. Wow. And we put up scaffolds, and we carry these gantries mm -hmm. on our shoulders <laughs> and climb up the scaffold, mm -hmm. you know, and secure them individually up there. Now, after putting up the gantry, and the gantry must be in the middle of the arch mm -hmm. because it's quite heavy. Okay. Otherwise, if you don't put it in the middle of the arch, the arch becomes lopsided, okay. and it means that it will begin to stress the mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. So it's important where you place the, the, the gantry. You must make sure that it is precisely in the middle of the arch. Now, after that, you have to secure the arches. So you see, once again, some cross beams between arch 1 and arch 2. Okay. Also serving as additional supports. Mm -hmm. Now, after you have done that, then we put in the rain gutters, which are at the end, the middle, and then the other end. Okay. So that the rain, which f I mean, flows from the top of the sheet, will just drain away and not affect the, the plants. Then after that, the next major step was the shade netting. What you see here, the almost gray black uh, thing that you see here, it's, it's a net. It's not just any net. It's a specialized net for greenhouses okay. because they are woven in such a way that insects and other pests cannot mm -hmm. penetrate. So we put up the shade nets at the mouth and then the sides mm -hmm. of, of each of the tunnels. Then we improvised on a kind of door, door which, through which we, we all go and access the greenhouse. Okay. So that goes for the structure. Mm -hmm. Now, what you see inside there is also another story of its own.
So first of all, we decide what kind of cultivar or plant that we want to grow. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it is tomatoes. Okay. Then we know the spacing which we have to give for tomatoes. Okay. And that would give us the number of troughs mm -hmm. per tunnel. Okay. So we have five troughs per tunnel here. Okay. Then the next phase was preparing the place to receive the, 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 the plants. So we bought the troughs, we cut them to the normal size, and then we dug small trenches underneath the troughs. Now, underneath the troughs, you see some stones. Okay. Now, underneath those stones, we cut uh, some U-shaped kind of gutter okay. so that the water which we pump into the medium would drain into the stones and into into the, the gutter underneath the trough okay. and then run all the way to the end where it is harvested at the extreme end. Okay. So that was the first thing that we did. We cut the gutters. So you have five gutters here mm -hmm. for the five troughs mm -hmm. and then we lined the gutters with plastic and then filled them with the stones. Mm -hmm. So the troughs are resting on the stones. Then the next thing that we, we, we had to do after putting in the troughs was to look at the irrigation system. So we started with a borehole where the water is extracted from the ground and then it is passed through a filtration system which is comparable to any of the, the water producing companies. I mean the best water producing companies you have in Ghana here because we had the water tested with the standards board and the result was excellent. So the water comes from a borehole. It is filtered through our filtration system and then pumped into the two tanks that we see up here. Mm -hmm. Now after the water has come into the tanks, we have the, the lines we have two lines which go into the two tunnels. Mm -hmm. These are the main lines okay. through which the water flows okay. or the solution, if you like. Mm -hmm. And then they go through the dripper lines, the smaller ones. Now, as the solution passes through, through them, they climb up into the individual troughs. Now, what we have there are two tubes which are perforated at different intervals. So the idea is that the water will drip as close to the root of the plant as possible on both sides okay. so that the plant is not shortchanged either way because it is getting water from side A or side B or the left and the right hand side. So the water drips. You, you can, I hope you can see yeah. the water dripping yeah. now because we are doing our uh -huh. se uh, second... Uh, Third, fertigation. Okay. And fertigation simply means mixing irrigation with fertilizer. Okay. So we are both giving them water and nutrients at the same time. So after laying all these dripper lines, then of course we came to nursing the plants, which we did. And after 21 days, we transplanted them here. And since then, we've been taking care of them till what you see. What of the temperature in the room? How do you control it? The temperature is controlled one by the kind of sheeting that we have up there. Okay. It is plastic, yes, but it is a special kind of plastic meant for greenhouses in Africa. And so what happens is that it reduces the amount of UV rays that enter the, uh, the greenhouse. And the shade nets are porous enough to allow for enough uh, ventilation mm -hmm. so that the greenhouse is, is not hot. What are the other greenhouses that I've seen, what they do is that this bottom part, they also use plastic oh, okay. so that it, the, the greenhouse is too humid for the plants. But what we did was to just use the shadeness throughout oh, okay. to allow for more air mm -hmm. in and out of the greenhouse oh, okay. and so we have a range of between on, on a hot day about 30 degrees uh, celsius okay. on a cold day this environment because the weather sometimes is extreme here okay. so 25 24. timothy insists the seedlings which are imported from south africa are not genetically modified you import your 
seeds from uh, um, South Africa, yes. and we know they have commercialized GMOs, and we have our own GMO debate yes, going on yes, here. Yes. So how sure are we that what you are producing now is not GM seeds? Yes, uh, I can state for a fact that the seedlings that we or the seeds that we use are not GMO seeds because the seed producer from which we sourced these seeds gave us two options, the GMO option and the non-GMO option. Because as you rightly pointed out, South Africa do, do not have a problem with GMOs. But in Ghana here, we are yet to have a fixed stance on GMOs. So we not wanting to uh, uh, you know, fall foul or find ourselves at the wrong end of the stick, assuming that uh, the legislature gives us a firm direction as to which way to go, decided to stick with the non-GMOs. So what we are producing here are not of the GMO stock. Even though at the end of the planting cycle, we'll still go to that seed producer for these particular kinds of seeds. But if we want to replicate what we have here, we can, because they are not GMO seeds. But that is also one of the problems which the local growers have, because what they do is that they reserve a portion of the harvest for planting the next season. And we all are aware that tomatoes are very delicate plants. So if you, you take out the seeds, you wash them, you dry them, and then you wait for the next season to plant, you are very likely to stress them, and then that would also affect the yield. So there is nothing wrong with buying the inputs or the, the, the seeds or the cultivars from seed producers, because after all, the uh, Greek cycle, I like to look at it as a chain. So you have the seed producers, you have the other input providers such as fertilizers. Then you have the producers who are the farmers. Then you should have the marketers and distributors who market and distribute the produce through their distribution channels and leave the farmer to concentrate on his competency, which is production. Operating a greenhouse means um, you're going to have production of tomatoes yes. all year round. Yes, and we know we have the lean season yes. and then when there is glut. Yes. How are you going to manage the price during these seasons? What we normally do is that we come to an agreement with uh, marketers and distributors so that they, we fix a price at which the produce is bought, irrespective of the season in which it is the lean season or the glut season, so that in case you meet the glut season where prices are depressed, you are assured of a reasonable price which you are factored into your cost of production and, and you know your gross profit and all, all of all of those things. Then of course when there is a scarcity and the price goes up because you have fixed the price, then definitely there's nothing you can do. So it's a form of hedging, you know, so that at least we, we, we can make sure projections based on a stable price that we, we receive. So basically what you are selling to your, uh, um, your buyers now yes. is what they would have to pay even when there is a glut? Yes, that is, that, that is the case. Even where there is a glut, that is the price which we, we have fixed. And so even where the prices are depressed in the market, we would get that particular price which we, we have set. But don't forget that when also there is a, a real scarcity and the price is at a, a premium level, we are stuck. We can't go higher than what we have agreed to. To so, sell for. So, would you be able to tell us how much is going for now? Uh, is it okay to tell us the price? Ah, uh, well, for for a kilo now, let's just say between four to six cities a oh. kilo for for the buyers. Oh. Though the facility is yet to be certified, Timothy says the tomatoes are produced under strict safety conditions. For now, there's no real regulation on greenhouse uh, farming. But of course, we all know that what we produce, we have the, the end user in sight, which means that we are also aware of the food and safety concerns. And we know that in Ghana here, it is the Food and Drugs Board 
authority now which certifies i mean uh, uh, products but for greenhouse they haven't given any indication and so as the the front runners we would see what can be done if other greenhouses greenhouse uh, operators will want to come together for us to get some form of certification which would provide some level of comfort to the consumers that what we produce are actually safe for human consumption. But even in the absence of regulation, I mean, every human being should regulate himself, know that what you are doing, you are producing food which other people would consume. So definitely for some of us who are exposed to what is called a good uh, general agricultural practices. We, we engage in it. You see that we have our taps here where we wash the hands. The house, the farmhouse is just uh, across the, the, the fence yeah. so that there are no issues of uh, uh, human fecal matter and all of that. And I've indicated to you that even the water that we give to them is filtered water, which is safe for human consumption. That is as far... And then, of course, the chemical... Uh, composition. We make sure that we comply with what is called the minimum residual levels for chemicals in plants for human consumption so that we have our schedules for when we sp spray the fungicides so that by the time it gets to the consumer the chemical content is at the acceptable level. That is what we are doing now on our own. But even the, the, the marketers and distributors who come for the produce from us, they also have their standards because they come and they, just as you are here, they come and inspect the place and ensure and satisfy themselves that we are engaged in the GAP and we are following what are called the HACCP protocols, all for human uh, uh, safety concerns. Farming in the greenhouse means tomatoes can be produced all year round. The farmers are hoping to upskill the business by expanding the greenhouse when this proves a success.